Hi guys, it's Dr. Sadaf, and I would love for you to like and share this podcast and make sure you leave me a review. I'd love those five stars. So please, when you send me a review, please make sure to put the five stars in and to share the episode with somebody that you know that could really use it. And I would absolutely appreciate it. Also, if you're looking to schedule an appointment with me, make sure you go to my email and put your name on the email list. You will be the first to know when I open up my office in spring of 2024. It's drsadaf.com. And last but definitely not the least, September 16th to the 23rd, 2024, I will be hosting a retreat with Dr. Basma Ferris in Morocco. You will be getting yoga and coaching and we'll be doing excursions and cooking and spa and hammam and all of that great stuff along with meditation. So make sure you don't miss out. Spots are limited. So go to the link in my bio in both Instagram and TikTok to make sure you register. Enjoy the show. I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Salaf Lodi, and this episode is everything you need to know about orgasms. But before I get into it, I want to make a few things clear. As always, this is not meant to be any type of medical information. So if you have any questions about orgasms or anything else for that matter, please speak with your healthcare provider. And if you're having any questions about your religion, please see your friendly neighborhood religious leader. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman that talks about sex. So a lot of people have direct messaged me and asked me to talk about orgasms. So I am going to spend this episode talking about orgasms and mainly focusing on female orgasms but I think a lot of it really can be applied to both. So not just one. And where it's possible, I will comment a little bit on uh, male orgasms, but really it's going to be focused on, on female. Okay. So just so you know, so we know that, so I spoke about, I did um, a podcast before on female sexual dysfunction. And so one of the things um, that's categorized by the American psychiatry association is and is in what they call the dsm-4 is the inability to orgasm and that's classified as one of the female sexual dysfunctions so it's kind of what i'm going to focus on a little bit today but i'll get into more of the details as well so female sexual dysfunction affects about 41 percent. so that's a pretty big number of reproductive age women worldwide. So this includes what I was talking about, so sexual interest or arousal disorder, which we typically called hypoactive sexual desire disorder or low libido. So that's kind of what that's referring to. Uh, There's also female orgasmic disorder. There's the genital pelvic pain or penetration disorder. And What I'm going to focus on today is really the orgasm, uh, orgasmic disorders, and really a little bit more about orgasms and um, kind of what they are and and such. So 10 to 15 percent of women say that they've never had an orgasm. In fact, the orgasm gaps, I'm sure you probably have heard of the orgasm gap. That was something that was trending a while ago, and it still comes up. And really what that's talking about is that heterosexual men tend to orgasm 95% of the time in partnered sex, whereas heterosexual women tend to orgasm only 65% of the time. And so some reasons for this could be basically, you know, a lack of knowledge, discrepancy of knowledge of the anatomy, a lack of women's entitlement, or really perhaps women don't feel that they have the right to orgasm, but they don't know, right? Not so much really the right, but I think really has a lot to do with not realizing that that's possible or that, you know, that that can happen for them. Distractions, we know that distractions are a huge killjoy in a partnered relationship. And we also know that that 
really does not work in a woman's favor if she's battling decreased arousal or libido and also now with orgasm. So a lot of those distractions can impact a woman's sexual response. And of course, being in a committed relationship where a person feels safe. So there was this research, there were actually a few research that were done. And what they noted was that women, although they orgasmed fewer than so heterosexual women tended to orgasm fewer than heterosexual men, but those same women tended to orgasm more if they were in a committed relationship as opposed to like a hookup or something like that, where they didn't have that emotional connection. And so we'll talk about that because I don't know if you remember, but I've often spoken about Rosemary Basson and her, the female sexual response cycle. And when she created that circular model uh, the female sexual response, she also put in there uh, woman's satisfaction in her relationship. So that also has a lot to do with whether or not a woman experiences orgasm. Really interesting because the same thing is actually not true for men. They don't have that same issue with being in, you know, feel, having the need to feel that they're like in this committed relationship. You know, they can still orgasm without that. Whereas for women, Women tend to need a lot more, I don't want to say women tend to be in their heads a lot more. That's not really the case. I think that it's that women have, you know, a lot of times they need the mood to be perfect. They need the, you know, they need fewer distractions. They don't, um, they don't really want it to be another chore, right? Because anytime something is a chore, then it becomes really less enjoyable. And I don't know of any person that enjoys doing chores. So I think that, you know, really when that happens, we have to change that narrative. And that's really where a sex coach can come in. But we're not talking about sex coaching right now. We're talking about orgasm. So really the important thing for women tended to be that they they really orgasmed more in a committed relationship. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what is what exactly is an orgasm. So Orgasm is often described as like the peak of pleasure. So it's the release of a built up tension in um, during the sexual response cycle, bringing about a rhythmic kind of involuntary muscular contractions in the pelvic region associated with pleasure. And we know that sometimes people can even experience orgasms just psychologically, like fantasizing that they can experience an orgasm. They don't even have to have that physical stimulation that typically we associate with the orgasm. Um, men tend to ejaculate when they reach an orgasm and women tend to experience more vaginal wall contractions, but you know, women can also ejaculate and some women can also squirt, right? And so, um, during sexual activity or when experiencing orgasm. So that can also happen for women. Uh, what we also know is that back when we first learned about the sexual response cycle, we know that the Masters and Johnson, the married couple team, right? They're the ones that did most of the research initially in the 1960s on um, the sexual response cycle. And what they had was like this linear model where people experienced excitement, then a plateau. So, you know, it kind of went up like this. So they experienced excitement, then there was like a plateau, and then they experienced orgasm. And then there was like this drop, which was called the resolution or what a lot of people will call like the refractory period between orgasms. And and then there was another researcher in the 1970s that came about. Her name was, uh, last name is Kaplan, and she included desire. So she said, no, it's not just this, you know, linear thing that just kind of happens on its own. You also need desire. And she placed that in the beginning. So there was like desire, excitement, plateau, orgasm, and then resolution. And then we had Rosemary Basson come along. And she said that, you know, with um, this whole sexual response cycle, she included desire and arousal. And she noted how that was influenced orgasm. And also the, basically she also included the satisfaction that a partner, so that a woman had in her relationship, which also affected orgasm. And really, if you look at the sexual response cycle in her model, she doesn't even have orgasm in there. She talks about arousal and desire, and she talks about 
responsive desire and spontaneous desire. And she talks about how everything is in a circle and how everything can be impacted by different things like biological things. For example, if you have a medical illness like diabetes or high blood pressure, any of those things, medications that you're put on for those can affect your uh, desire and your arousal, which then of course we know affects orgasm, right? And so she talked about how all of those things are involved. And also we know through the biopsychosocial model that, you know, your environment what's happening socially can also affect you, right? If you're a single mom working four jobs, that's gonna impact you in terms of your arousal and your desire. If you are constantly preoccupied with other thoughts like the laundry, the children, uh, your body image, what you're looking like, right? All of that is going to impact whether or not you're able to orgasm. So, you know, all of these things really should be taken in holistically because all of those things right? The biopsychosocial, what's happening to you psychologically, right? Are you experiencing a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression? Are your meds affecting your arousal? Are your meds affecting your libido? All of those things are going to play into whether or not you're able to or orgasm. And we know, again, like I've stated before several times, that we know that the brain is the biggest sexual organ. So whether or not you are completely in, right, mindfully present in your body is also going to affect whether or not you experience orgasm and how it looks like for you um, in your body. So that's really important to understand. So, you know, I mentioned a little bit about refractory periods, right? So what exactly is a refractory period? So a refractory period is the time it takes before you're able to orgasm again. Um, and for men, it could be uh, or to, you know, for men, it's really, you know, when they're able to have an erection again to orgasm and that refractory period for some men, you know, when they're younger, it could be like a few minutes to maybe like a half hour. And then as they get older, right, as men get older, then their refractory period could be 24 hours or even longer. So uh, for some men, it just really depends. Uh, for women, they actually do not have that same refractory period time as men. So women could potentially have multiple orgasms um, and that they could have intercourse again and orgasm again if they wanted to. And we know, and I'll get into it, that women don't necessarily even orgasm with penetration. Um, and that's really the whole point of this orgasm gap is that to realize that women don't always they can sometimes, but women don't always orgasm with penile vaginal intercourse. And really it's the stimulation of the clitoris is what causes that orgasm to occur. And that's why the orgasm gap is there because a lot of times, a lot of the media, everything is focused on that uh, penile vaginal intercourse and making it seem like women orgasm from that, but really they don't. And even just calling that whole pelvic region. And this is what, um, if, I don't know if you all remember, but I had author Lori Mintz on and she wrote that book, Becoming Cliterate. And she talks about it as well as that, you know, the whole pelvic external genitalia for women, instead of being called the vulva, people refer to it as the vagina, as if, you know, the whole purpose of women is to satisfy men, right? But that's a whole nother talk. So um, really to understand that women do not have that same refractory period and that women can actually have multiple orgasms is really important to understand. And sometimes though, women after they orgasm may have hypersensitivity of the clitoris or the vulva and stimulation may be uncomfortable. And so women may not want to orgasm away, orgasm right away, or, you know, they may not have to, may not want to have intercourse right afterwards. So that's something to also be really important to have that discussion with your partner because as we know the biggest factor in any type of relationship uh, with two people is communication and that is really really important in a uh, intimate relationship with your partner is the number one reason why women are sexually satisfied in their relationship is that they are able to have open communication with their partner. They're able to tell them what they like, what they don't like. And, and that is really, really important. So what are the different types of orgasmic disorders? So we know that um, women can experience, right? So they, there's a whole category of female sexual dysfunction under uh, orgasm. So orgasmic disorders can definitely lead to distress, frustration, feeling of shame, 
for both the person experiencing it and then of course for their partner because then their partner thinks well you know they're not able to give their partner an orgasm whatever and they're not enjoying it and it's not pleasurable so there's a lot of things i would say a lot of mental drama going on in both of the partners minds around you know a person not being able to experience an orgasm and um so what happens is that also when we talk about orgasm so here i'm talking specifically for um female orgasmic disorders okay so they center around the absence or the significant delay of orgasms following sufficient stimulation so the partner is being stimulated but they're not able to orgasm and um, there's four types of orgasmic uh, dysfunction we have primary and orgasmia, which is a condition where you've never had an orgasm. There's a uh, secondary orgasm, which is a difficulty of a person being able to reach orgasm, even though you've had one before. Uh, there's situational orga inorgasmia, which is basically, of course, what a name sounds like, right? That they're not able to orgasm based on what's happening. So it's the most common type of orgasmic dysfunction. And it typically occurs when you can only orgasm in specific situations. So for example, if some women may only be able to orgasm with like oral stimulation or masturbation or something like that. And maybe not with um, their partner uh, through penile vaginal intercourse. So, you know, that's called a situational anorgasmia. And then there's general anorgasmia, which is the inability to achieve orgasm under any circumstance. So even when a person is highly aroused and their sexual stimulation is sufficient, they're not able to orgasm. And, you know, that can even be due to um, a person having clitoral phimosis. So basically the clitoris has tissue surrounding it, almost like an uncircumcised penis, right? There's um, tissue that surrounds the glands, the head, <clears throat> Of the penis. So in women, they have a similar where there is tissue that surrounds the head. Now, if that tissue comes up and it closes off, there might not, you can't get to the head of the clitoris. So if there's no, if there's no ability to stimulate it. The patient, the person may get aroused, but may not be able to ex experience an orgasm or that orgasm may be muted. So that might be also a type of orgasmic dysfunction. Um, you know, how do people, sometimes, you know, a question comes up, like, how can people lose their ability to orgasm? Well, it can happen for a lot of reasons. And we know that some people may not be receiving the right type of stimulation during intercourse. Other times, uh, perhaps a person has experienced trauma that they're not able to, and, or others simply may not be interested. And I think Honestly, I think that when a person is not interested, it could also be due to the fact that they're not really present or even perhaps, even if they are present, perhaps that person is asexual, right? So a lot of things go into that as to why a person may not be able to experience an orgasm. And so again, that really requires you to have an open conversation with, you know, either definitely with yourself and to think about what may be causing that, but also to have that discussion with your partner and let them know that, you know, either maybe it's something that they're doing or maybe it's not something that they're doing, uh, or maybe it's something that's going on in your head, whatever it may be, right? That all of that requires an open communication. Um, there was a study that was done in 2018 that did an analysis of 100 35 studies from 41 different countries. And it included basically, so there was a systemic review of all of these articles. And these researchers identified a bunch of factors that increase the risk of sexual dysfunction, including, of course, as you may have figured, right? Relationship problems, stress, mental health issues, lack of knowledge about sexual function, poor physical health, which we know can absolutely impact men in terms of their erectile function. We know that if men are not able to have an erection, it could be a sign of a bigger problem like coronary artery disease, right? We know that the arteries going to the penis can uh, get blocked first 
And so if they are experiencing that, that may be a sign for them to actually go get their heart checked out. So really important information. So if that's, if there's anyone that's experiencing that, make sure, you know, you also see a cardiologist to get a look and uh, take a look at the heart function as well. So poor physical health may be a cause, uh, hormonal disorders such as menopause. But, you know, honestly, what happens in menopause, and I'll talk about it a little bit, is that genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And it's the decrease in estrogen, which causes a decrease in blood flow to the genitals. And what happens with that is that when there's decreased blood flow, you require longer stimulation, longer... I guess you could call it foreplay, but longer stimulation to the genitals for that area, for that blood to come in, right? And also to become lubricated. So what can help with that is vaginal estrogen, definitely lubricants, definitely, you know, some moisturizers, but really the gold standard for the gender urinary syndrome of menopause is really vaginal estrogen. So that would really help and could possibly also help with orgasmic function. And also remember, because what's happening is that if you are increasing the amount of estrogen coming to those genitals, you're improving that blood flow, which will allow that uh, arousal to occur, right? And also prevent painful sex, which is also important. But um, you can also use vaginal testosterone. So what happens is that in menopause, there's the decreased receptors of estrogen and um, testosterone in what we call the vestibule of the vulva. And, you know, when you're putting that estrogen testosterone cream to help with the vestibule and also with the bladder health, because um, the bladder health needs that testosterone as well as the estrogen, that can also, if you happen to get some of that testosterone in the area of the clitoris, that testosterone we know increases libido. And so that can possibly also help with orgasms. Also, we talked about uh, gender urinary issues such as pelvic pain and endometriosis that can definitely affect your ability to have an orgasm. Because remember, anytime you're going to have pain, right, you're not going to want something that elicits pain. If you're having pain with intercourse, you're not going to want it. So, and of course, that's going to affect your arousal. It's going to affect your libido. It's going to affect whether or not, you know, you're able to orgasm because if you're not enjoying it, then, um, you know, you're probably not going to orgasm. I mean, I, guess, I suppose you could, but I would think that it would probably be either it could be uncomfortable or uh, you may not enjoy it and you may, maybe you don't even want the sex because you're having pelvic pain. Surgery in the pelvic area, history of, um, you know, female genitals. So I have a whole episode coming up. So make sure that you listen to the episode on female genital mutilation. I have a great uh, physician that's going that talks about it and whether or not women can experience pleasure. And we all know that women can experience pleasure after uh, female genital mutilation. But you know, she and I will go into greater depths of what that is and how they can experience pleasure. Um, people that may have experienced sexual abuse, right? And also, if you have a lot of sex negativity where you think that sex is shameful, wrong, dirty, right? It's, that's definitely going, definitely going to affect whether or not you're able to experience an orgasm and how you feel after, right? Are you experiencing pleasure? Or are you experiencing guilt after an orgasm occurs? So all of that, all of those things can affect how you feel about yourself, but also whether or not you're able to experience an orgasm. The same study also identified some modifiable risk factors that could improve the sexual experience, whether it's exercise, you know, if you feel better about yourself, you feel better about your body, you're probably going to experience um, probably better orgasms, really. Uh, daily affection from your partner. So again, we see that where Rosemary Basson talked about the relationship factor in a person experiencing arousal and desire. So if you are in a well-supported um, relationship, right, where you both uh, support each other, love each other, respect each other, then that deeper connection, that emotional intimacy is going to lead to a deeper connection, which will probably uh, also help with you having orgasms. Uh, positive body image. We know that sex education and familiarity with uh, the anatomy is absolutely going to help you have an orgasm and being able to communicate with your partner, right? 
along with that, we know that uh, for women and for, you know, for their ability to experience an orgasm, things that help, which I think would help in any relationship anyway. So I don't think it's specific to just, you know, experiencing an orgasm would be what type of relationship, like we talked about, you know, deep connection with your partner, also deep kissing. And um, sometimes if uh, people are having a hard time uh, orgasming, sometimes oral sex will help as well. Uh, and so manipulation, um, touching, during intercourse, all of that is going to help you to experience an orgasm. So now, is there anything that can be done to treat these orgasmic disorders? Definitely. Now, remember, if it's anatomical, absolutely, right? So absolutely, there can be something that can be done. And if you know that there's nothing, you know, your relationship is fantastic, everything's fantastic with your partner, but you're just not able to experience an orgasm, please go and see your healthcare provider. Go see uh, a doctor that focuses on sexual medicine so that they can do a proper exam, so they can take a look at that vulva properly and examine the clitoris and make sure that there isn't what we have, what we call phimosis, where that tissue is covering the glands uh, or the head of that clitoris so that you are able to experience an orgasm and so that your orgasms are not muted right? So that's going to be important to definitely have that physical exam. Also, if you are on some type of antidepressants, right? Antidepressants we know can also sometimes inhibit the orgasms. And we know that different medications can affect. We know that medications for sure affect your libido. Uh, we know that birth control pills can affect your libido. They can also affect your desire. And, um, Absolutely. Anything that affects your arousal, your desire, uh, your libido is going to absolutely affect your uh, ability to have an orgasm. So remember that medications can affect it as well. So important for you to take a look and see what the side effects of your medications that you're on could possibly be. Uh, we also know that cognitive behavioral therapy absolutely can help, right? So if everything else comes out negative and everything else is fine and your relationship is fantastic, then I would definitely st start to look a little bit deeper and maybe start looking at your thoughts and see how your thoughts are affecting how you feel about yourself and about your relationship. Look into sex coaching. You know, I'm here to help you as a sex coach, but also sex coaches really help to move patients forward. And I think that that is really, really important um, in terms of anyone that's exhibiting or has any type of female sexual dysfunction, really important to get the help that you need. Of course, couples counseling is always a good idea if you're having any issues with your relationship and you find that um, you could probably benefit, right, from a couples counselor. And also, if you have a hard time speaking with your partner about things that are of value to you, for example, if you're having issues with orgasm and you're having a hard time speaking to your partner about it, you may want to go to a couple therapist that could help facilitate that discussion. And then, um, and really a couples therapist that's also a sex therapist, I think would probably be the best way to go so that you can talk about all of those issues and that person really knows how to help you with that. We know that uh, in menopause, there's also so many changes that happen. And so estrogen therapy can definitely help uh, a lot of the issues that we see in menopause involving the vulva and that uh, general pelvic region uh, involving the bladder and recurrent bladder infections, all of those things, we know that estrogen really helps. Testosterone also, we know helps with libido. So if you're having, if you're experiencing a hypoactive sexual desire disorder, uh, which is low libido or decrease of interest, right? Uh, in interest or arousal, we know that testosterone can absolutely help and it's used off label in women. It's a 10th of the dose that's used for men and it's applied as a cream on either the buttocks or the back of the thigh. And, you know, it's used for a few weeks to see whether or not it makes a difference in your libido and if it's really going to help you or not. But again, you know, anything that's affecting your arousal, your libido is going to also affect your orgasm. So all of those things are kind of interconnected. Uh, what type of orgasms are there? Well, there's so many different types of orgasm. And this list definitely is not exhaustive. So 
Um, you know, if I don't mention the type of orgasm that you're familiar with, you know, like I said, this list is not exhaustive and I'm sure that there are so many different types of orgasms that, you know, perhaps I may not even mention, but I'll just start with a few. There's the clitoral orgasm, right? Which is the one way, one surefire way that uh, a woman can orgasm is stimulation of the clitoris and that uh, there was an article released in 2019 that noted that 60% of female orgasms occurred due to clitoral stimulation alone. So really important that if you're wondering why you're not able to have an orgasm or looking into it, know that uh, oftentimes a clitoral stimulation is really required. So important to understand your anatomy, know what you like, know what you don't like, so you can tell your partner and know that more than likely clitoral stimulation will probably, is probably going to be involved. Um, there are also vaginal orgasms. So interesting, you know, there's a lot of articles on this. So because, you know, it was thought before and really by Freud who said that uh, women, you know, that the clitoris was not necessary and that women as they got older and were more mature only needed vaginal uh, penetration, they would orgasm. And that if they had clitoral orgasm, it was that they were still immature, uh, which of course we know is not true. And he was not obviously knowledgeable in women's health or women's anatomy to make those type of comments. But we know that most women uh, do not orgasm alone just with vaginal penetration. They, you know, it's just, some women can, not saying that it doesn't happen, but more than likely women will require clitoral stimulation and that vaginal orgasm will occur uh, with vaginal stimulation and sometimes with also stimulation of the G-spot. So we know that the G-spot is really kind of, it's, um, it's like this erectile spongy tissue that is on the anterior portion of the vagina. And a lot of people feel that it's uh, actually just uh, more of the clitoral uh, nerves that are really causing it. And that's what that erectile tissue is. It's more of the clitoris because we know that what we see of the clitoris is really kind of like the tip of the iceberg. You know, that's kind of what you see. But most of it actually extends far back into like the vulva, the labia. And so that's why the labia are also very sensitive to touch and to stimulation. And so uh, that's why it's more important to really understand the anatomy and know that, um, you know, the clitoris really extends and that G-spot may actually just be uh, part of the erectile spongy tissue from the clitoris. The vaginal orgasms we know are related to indirect stimulation of the clitoris during sex. So that's how that can happen. And then, you know, people will talk about a blended orgasm, which is basically an orgasm of uh, the clitoral and vaginal orgasms occurring together. So that would be with uh, perhaps some stimulation and also penetration, all that happening. Some people, you know, will experience an a G-spot orgasm, we know that because of stimulation of the G-spot. And I spoke a little bit about that. Of course, we know it's on the anterior third of uh, the roof of the vagina. That's where we think that, we don't think that's where we know that the G-spot is. That's where it was identified. And uh, a lot of women will orgasm with that, um, but not everyone. And uh, we know that also that women can experience multiple orgasms, right? We talked a little bit about that, that they're, they don't seem to have a refractory period and uh, women can have a series of orgasms. And that they, if when they do have a refractory period, uh, it just tends to be shorter, which allows them to have those multiple orgasms. There's also people that can have imagery induced orgasms that can occur as a response to images and um, they can be either, you know, fantasies or self-induced. And um, the basically the brain is connected to, the regions of the brain are connected to orgasm reward and uh, bodily stimulation. So you can have that happen. Uh, that can also happen. There can also be like a nipple orgasm. So lots of different types of orgasms. And I know that I did not cover all the different types of orgasms. And 
Uh, so I'm sure you can Google those and take a look at what are the all the other different types as well. But those are some of the most common ones that you have. Uh, some people, you know, will ask me what exactly happens with an orgasm. And we know I kind of mentioned those rhythmic contractions that happen. Some people can also uh, feel flushed. They can feel sleepy. They can feel relaxed. And uh, oftentimes what that happens is because after an orgasm, there's chemicals that are released from the brain called dopamine and oxytocin. Oxytocin is known as the love hormone or the bonding hormone. And dopamine is one of those uh, hormones that causes people to be happy. And so because those hormones are released with orgasm, that's why people tend to really enjoy orgasms and like the way they feel uh, because of how they feel afterwards. We talked a little bit about how people can experience them. So some people, you know, I think what's really important to know is what you like and what you don't like. And there's different schools of thought if you are Muslim. Uh, there's different schools of thought about masturbation. I'm not going to get into that. Definitely speak with your religious scholar and with your school of thought about masturbation. This is definitely not what this podcast is about. But, you know, depending on what your school of thought is, Masturbation is a good way to know what you like and what you don't like. And then you can then tell your partner what you like and what you don't like. Right. So uh, it's people cannot read each other's minds. Uh, people don't know what you like, what you don't like until you tell them. So and how is a way that you're going to tell them, especially for some Muslims, uh, for Muslims that are practicing and may not have had any experience uh, and most w Muslims do not have experience outside of marriage. Um, it's tough to tell your partners what you like, and what you don't like, because you've never been in an intimate relationship before. So again, depending on what your school of thought is, you know, masturbation might be a way to figure out what you like, what you don't like. And uh, if you have any doubts, you know, definitely speak with somebody, your religious scholar on your school of thought to see whether or not it's something that would be right for you to do. Um, Anyways, I think that that is really one of the important things to know uh, what you like and how to experience them. And of course, like I talked about before, that you know the reason why people enjoy them is because of the hormones that are released, and they it allows a very pleasurable, very calming feeling after an orgasm. So that's why a lot of people enjoy them. So that is it, my friends, and it's been real and really intimate. So remember, if you are experiencing female sexual dysfunction, or if you're a man and listening to this and you're experiencing some type of rectal dysfunction or premature ejaculation, make sure you go see, first and foremost, what I would recommend is go see your healthcare provider, right? So definitely a doc um, that specializes in sexual medicine. Urologists are great because they specialize, they, you know, actually get it in residency, whereas a lot of gynecologists don't, but I am trained in sexual medicine. So, you know, I get it, but uh, definitely go see a provider that understands sexual medicine, that understands what's going on with you, that has the time to spend with you. And so that you can go over, you know, your orgasmic, if you are, if you're having orgasmic, any type of orgasmic dysfunction or female sexual dysfunction that you are concerned about, that you are really worried and you don't know what's going on. You know, it's really helpful to see a provider that can help you out and listen to you and take time with you. Uh, for a man, if you are, again, you know, experiencing the same, I would suggest you see a urologist because they have training and they can help you. And uh, for men that are experiencing erectile dysfunction, I would definitely get your heart checked as well because you want to make sure that the arteries are not blocked and or, you know, that you get checked out for diabetes because sometimes diabetes also will affect erectile function. So you want to make sure that nothing's going on. And, you know, for both genders, I think that it's really important to you know, kind of take a look inside and see if you have any psychological issues going on, right? Do you have anxiety? Do you have depression? Do you have negative thoughts that may be holding you back that may not be allowing you to experience pleasure? Maybe you think it's wrong. Maybe you think it's dirty. Maybe you think it's shameful. All of those things, right, can all come into play. And that's why with sexual medicine, we always talk about the biopsychosocial model because really, 
you can't examine a patient without looking at them holistically and looking at everything else that they are experiencing, what they're going through, um, so that you can help to better understand and help your patients out. And as patients, you should definitely seek out providers that are comfortable discussing sexual health topics with you so that you can get the help that you need, okay? And this is not meant to be medical advice. So definitely, you know, if you're having any issues, please speak with your healthcare provider and go see them to be evaluated. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. So thank you for listening to the podcast and make sure you leave us a review, share and like the podcast. And if you leave me a review, I'd love to shout you out on social media. So be sure that you share it with all your friends. And thanks for listening.